and welcome. You're watching Tech 24, France 24's tech show. In this edition, we tell you more about the International Space Station. You hear about it all the time, but did you know that it's actually the world's largest international cooperative program in science and technology? From astro farming to testing new materials and advancing med tech, Dan and Jay Cattlecar will shed light on some of the most incredible experiments that are being conducted on that platform. And you've been dreaming about it while sitting in gridlock traffic in the morning. In Test 24, we try the flying motorcycle Lazarus LMV 496. For now, it's only a peek into the future of transportation. But first, as British lawmakers seem unable to agree on anything over Brexit, a grassroots movement has arisen within London's tech industry to try and prevent the UK's divorce from the European Union. A group of entrepreneurs are developing websites hoping to put public pressure on politicians to give people a second vote. UK Royer reports. They descended on the streets of London in their tens of thousands. Just days before the initial planned departure date, protesters raised their voices to say no to Brexit and to call for a second referendum. Efforts to append the divorce are also taking place here, where a group of entrepreneurs, mostly volunteers, have been trying to come up with a solution. We actually wanted to do something to help enable people like ourselves, it transformed the British democracy and, and the main goal was to fight Brexit. The group, called Tech for UK, aims to galvanise the public to put pressure on policymakers as well as to better inform people about the benefits of staying in the EU. Since its launch last year, it has rolled out a dozen mobile-friendly websites, starting with My EU, which shows people EU-funded projects in their neighbourhood. So we click on the logo just next to us, this is our location, okay. and then when you scroll next. down, so you can see what kind of uh, project has been funded the through the EU. Another website, Hey MP, is designed to help users send messages directly to their representatives in Parliament to ask for another vote. It's very simple. What you do is you enter your postcode. If we can make it easier for them to make their voice feel heard, then that makes a monumental difference. So one of the things that we've been focusing on is making it easier for people to write to their MPs. Just in the last 10 days, more than 6,000 messages have been sent out using the app. The group says it wants to use technology to counter misinformation and negative campaigns about Britain's EU membership, which may have helped persuade people to vote Leave in the 2016 referendum. And it's been more than 20 years since the first module of the International Space Station was launched. This space lab that orbits our planet from an altitude of 400 kilometers is a great example of not only engineering excellence, but also of international collaboration. In fact, it's the world's largest international cooperative program in science and technology, with Russia, the United States, Japan, Canada, and 11 European countries being partners in this endeavor. Well, to talk more about this, let's welcome our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. Hello and welcome, Dan. Hello, A Junior. couple of days ago, senior representatives of space agencies were here in Paris meeting and talking about the International Space Station and the future of this platform. Tell us more about it. Well, the story of the space station starts on November 20, 1998, when the first module, Zarya, was launched into orbit uh, by a proton rocket. Two weeks later, another module, Unity, was launched as well. And these two modules were attached and they formed the first blocks of what now is a five-bedroom sized house International Space Station. And with the solar panels uh, up and running, the size of the entire structure is equivalent to that of a football field. Now, there are some very interesting numbers. The one you, you have already mentioned that it orbits at an altitude of 400 kilometers. but its speed is 28,000 kilometers per hour. It orbits Earth 16 times in 24 hours. So just it's gigantic. All the numbers are gigantic. Now, it's, it's a remarkable achievement. And let's listen in to uh, Pascal Ehrenfreund, who is the chair of the executive board of the German Aerospace Center. I think the International Space Station is a really fantastic um, 
the infrastructure in order to prepare for exploration, for living and working in space. And we are doing a lot of experiments on the International Space Station for exploration. Uh, we are growing, uh, you know, for instance, uh, uh, salad uh, tomatoes. We are uh, testing the stress level. We are looking at crew interactions. We are doing medically tests for radiation and for cardiovascular systems. So this is all in order to go further into deep space. So Dan, I don't know if I heard this right, but I heard her say that we're growing salad and tomatoes in space. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, the International Space Station is essentially a scientific laboratory. There are multiple experiments, including the growth of crops. I mean, why should we grow crops in space? Well, it's important because we are soon planning missions uh, to the moon, to Mars. So it's important that we are able to sustain ourselves with uh, ingrown food. So that's one example. Secondly, uh, there are also interesting spin-offs of uh, this technology. So while growing uh, these crops uh, in the chambers, uh, scientists, they used a technology to remove uh, the naturally occurring plant hormone, hormone called ethylene. Now ethylene in um, say restricted environment, the, a high concentration of ethylene in restricted environment is detrimental to the growth of plants. So it's essential to remove uh, this hormone and they did so very efficiently and now uh, this technology has been adapted on our planet and you can see its use in uh, grocery stores and even uh, winemakers are using it. What lies ahead for the International Space Station? Well, uh, as of now, we all know that uh, the, the, the future of the space station has been guaranteed until the end of 2024. Uh, but beyond that, uh, as was discussed in this, uh, uh, in this program in Paris, uh, there's, the, there's the possibility of international collaboration, in, that is the involvement of other countries. There's also the possibility of commercialization and privatization. I asked this question on how the space station is going to evolve in the coming years to uh, Sergei Krivalev, who is the director of manned space flights at Roscosmos. This is what he had to say. I think in the nearest future we have, and we will see more and more uh, companies uh, or organizations will come and do uh, some activity on the station. India is very interested in space. Uh, we know that China, China have uh, own space program, but I think in future we can do some experiments together. Uh, I know that uh, Arab countries are very active now uh, developing their space programs, and I think uh, they just recently, last week or a couple of weeks ago, they settled some kind of community of uh, different space uh, agencies or organizations uh, that are going to do uh, some joint activity on the station. Well, Julia, to summarize, it's important to have our presence in low Earth orbits because of all the benefits that uh, have come to us so far uh, because of the International Space Station. So we can have an alternate space station and uh, other, I mean, multiple agencies are also thinking of going beyond the low Earth orbit. For example, there's this uh, proposal of a lunar gateway in which uh, there'll be uh, missions that will be orbiting the moon for, or rather to prepare for future lunar colonies. So that is the future. Thank you, Dan and Jay Kattelkar there about all these experiments happening just above our heads. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to Test 24. It's what we call an unidentified flying object. The set of Test 24 this week has transformed itself into a landing strip for a one-of-a-kind Batmobile, Dan. That's right, Julia. This is the brainchild of Ludovic Lazaret an ANSI-based engineer, a very courageous engineer, who managed to put a set of six jet engines on this motorcycle. So as you mentioned earlier, this is a flying motorcycle inspired from, I don't know, Batmobile or one of the Mad Max movies. But this is a really interesting piece of technology because, for example, this and interestingly, it's, an, it's a homologated motorcycle, so you can uh, ride it on roads. Uh, of course, the you can't All the fly bulk, it on roads yet, but you can you can use it on roads. Yeah, but and... the bulk you see on this motorcycle, it's a bit misleading because this has been inspired from Lazaret's earlier model, which was extremely powerful. It had a, a V8 Maserati engine as its source, and you could reach up to 200 kilometers per hour. But this is uh, driven by electric engine, powered by electric engine, 
and the maximum speed as a motorcycle you can reach is up to 100 kilometers an hour. Now the reason why they had to put an electric engine is because in order to make it fly you need the bike to be light and it's extremely light. I was surprised to hear that it's only 145 kilograms. It weighs only 145 kilograms. So by pushing uh, a few buttons you can you can uh, uh, trigger the actuators which then uh, tilt and uh, basically they take these wheels apart and they tilt them and they and become you can wings see in a way they become wings and then these uh, jet cat jet turbines they get activated so you can have four or uh, one for each wheel but also you can have two additional uh, jet engines uh, under the chassis and interestingly this model is called lmv 496 so the four is for the four jet engines and 96 is the 96,000 revolutions per minute of the engine of each engine that is so that's how it's named and also it is also an indication of its price can you guess how much is it from the number I told you so 496 thousand thousand oh, it's I think one of the not most not quite affordable for us yeah, yet not at all so yeah this is a very interesting piece of machinery and it, and it took uh, Ludovic just uh, an year and year and a half to conceive and uh, build this prototype. Now, is it really the world's first flying motorcycle? Because I, I feel like we hear that all the time, but is it the It truth? seems so. I haven't seen any other motorcycle that you can just roll on the street and decide to fly. Like, you stop and it takes, I think, a minute or so to turn it just into like a in flying a vehicle. Movie. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech24, but you can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you next time.